Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today for uh, another webinar hosted by ChemSpace. Uh, before we begin, I would like to remind you that uh, this webinar will be recorded. So, if, so if you want to see it again, or uh, some of your colleagues that uh, can make it today, you, we will be able to share you the, the recording with you uh, via our YouTube can, channel. Uh, before we begin, I would like to hear whether you can uh, see my screen and uh, hear me well. So could you please type in, in the chat that everything is fine? Okay. Great. Uh, thank you so much. So, uh, before we begin, I would like to just remind you what who we are and what we're doing and what ChemSpace actually is. So, ChemSpace is an online catalog, searchable uh, and uh, basically purchasable of uh, that contains billions of molecules, small molecules. Uh, so it's a marketplace that hosts uh, compounds from over 70 suppliers, well known, and uh, it's been created uh, to make your life easier and to source not from all the suppliers and send uh, 70 emails, but just one place, ChemSpace. Currently, ChemSpace database contains over 330 in-stock building blocks and reagents from over 30 preferred suppliers. And those are available uh, in one to seven within one to seven business days. Uh, we have over 5.8 billion in stock screening compounds. Uh, all these compounds are focused on medicinal chemistry and pharma research. Uh, along with that, we have billions of make on demand analogs uh, to these in stock compounds. These make-on-demand compounds are thoroughly uh, based on thoroughly documented synthetic pr procedures uh, from seven well-known uh, suppliers. Uh, typical lead time for these make-on-demand compounds they it, between two and uh, six weeks, uh, and the success rate for the synthesis of these molecules is over 75 percent. So that's that's what we offer on ChemSpace. Uh, ChemSpace catalog available online through chemspace.com uh, web page. Uh, we, we, we support API integration with the client application and we support uh, ERP, integration with ERP through punch out. Uh, with that, I would like to introduce our today's speaker, Professor Alexander Saev from Carnegie Mellon University who will be talking uh, today about a very hot topic, artificial intelligence solutions for computational and organic chemistry tasks. A few words uh, about uh, Alexander. So he is, uh, he received his master's uh, from Ukraine, from Dnipropetrovsky National University. Uh, he got his PhD from Jackson State University and worked as research scientist and assistant professor uh, at the UNC. And recently, he moved to Carnegie Mellon University, where he occupies uh, assistant professor position now. Uh, with that, I would like to handle uh, everything to Alexander and let him present his talk. Thanks. Thanks, Yuri. Okay. Hopefully you can see my screen. Yes, yes. Perfect. Okay, uh, thank you so much. And thanks for, you know, ChemSpace and Yuri in particular organizing this. And um, so today I'd like to show you a couple of things that we've been doing for the past four or five years in the area of intersection between uh, machine learning and in computational chemistry. And before I run out of time, so let me acknowledge uh, members of my lab, in particular Roman Zubatuk, um, who's a postdoc in my lab, and uh, lab of my 
partner in crime, Adrian Robert at the University of Florida. So a lot of these things done in cooperation with him. Funding from ONR, National Science Foundation, and uh, a lot of uh, HPC resources because um, some of these tasks are extremely uh, compute demanded. <clears throat> Thanks all of these agencies who provide um, compute time. Now, um, uh, so let me start with uh, kind of a brief motivation. So if you look on, you know, news in these, uh, indeed, you know, the, the AI and, you know, it has been all time hype. Right? And, and, and you see these titles, even in the, you know, in the scientific uh, outlets so of this, uh, you know, Royal Society News is a brave new world of robot chemists and, you know, synthesis farms await and, you know, there is a smaller type, basically, wanted synthetic chemists, humans need not apply or chemical engineering use, rise of the smartest machine. So there is a, you know, there is a definitely you know, hype um, in, in, in this field. Uh, but let me, you know, just show you, you know, one uh, interesting quote from Derek Lowe, uh, who, who write the blog for science and translational medicine, that he said, it's not that machines are going to replace chemists, it's that the, the chemists who use machines will replace uh, those that don't. And I think this is interesting, and thought provoking quote, especially from Derek, who's a you know very skeptical mind, and um, you know despite the, uh, all the hype, you know my view on the machine learning and AI kind of pragmatic. So I think about it as this uh, you know Swiss Army knife. So it has its own utility. It can do a lot of different things, but it's not perfect. But I think uh, where it can do its job, it does it perfectly. And you know, there are indeed you know, many successes in publication machine learning and chemistry despite the hype. You know, in particular in our lab, you know, we, we work a lot um, uh, also in material discovery as part of the, what's called AFLO uh, consortium of academic labs. Uh, we develop a lot of um, you know, algorithms and you know, machine learning representation for inorganic materials, for two-dimensional materials. We collaborated with the experimental groups where machine learning can guide the experiment and therefore, you know, inform what material or molecule to synthesize. You know, we've, we've done some work on uh, visualization where you can essentially visualize a chemist, chemical space and see any patterns or, you know, clustering patterns. And, and, and kind of bring us closer to the topic of this of this talk. We work in the you know, obviously medchem field, uh, in, in for example, in the field of generative models, where a machine uh, can uh, suggest uh, new molecules. And uh, finally, what's the what the purpose of, of this talk is is where AI machine learning can accelerate quantum mechanics and uh, and provide those calculations faster. Be more accurate. Now, uh, very briefly, since you know I'm uh, from the academia, you know I can show equations in my talk. So, extremely briefly, you know this is the time-dependent Schrodinger equation, uh, and this is partial uh, differential equation. And this, you know, there is no way to solve this equation analytical uh, for anything but you know hydrogen atom. So, therefore, we have to solve it numerically, uh, and for practical you know, molecules or materials, basically you need a supercomputer um, uh, to get the accurate solution of this equation. And, and therefore it, 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 it takes time and, and efforts to do so. However, if you look for this equation from the point of view of machine learning and renderation the terms, so your ground state energy E uh, is, is basically, we can scoop all the complexity uh, of the quantum mechanics into this function F, uh, would depend on uh, molecular coordinates. And therefore, this is exactly a regression problem. And, uh, and that's why we can use uh, machine learning. Uh, and this is exactly what we do. So we use neural network. We feed molecular coordinates uh, to neural network. And we compute energy. Uh, one of the beauty of our neural networks, they're fully differentiable. Therefore, we can back propagate and calculate gradients. And therefore, we can get forces on, on atoms and and 
this would allow us to do all sorts of uh, molecular simulations like geometry minimization, molecular dynamics, uh, thermochemistry, and so forth. Um, now, uh, just uh, you know, kind of uh, put things into perspective, where do we fit? So you can build a kind of cartoonish uh, plot like this. So on x, x, k, on x, x, you have the computational scaling of the methods. Uh, the, depending on the system size uh, and some kind of metric of accuracy. And you can build kind of hierarchy of these of this methods. Uh, basically, uh, more accurate, you know, uh, solution you want to have, you know, higher price you need to pay in terms of, you know, the computational scaling and therefore time to solution. Um, so you're interested to do simulation of proteins, you basically stuck in this uh, low, um, um, on the left corner, where you have to rely on the force fields. Force fields can be accurate, but also can be extremely uh, bad and non transferable. Therefore, you know, if you want to systematically uh, improve your solution, you, you have to climb this ladder. And you know, uh, for practical purpose, you know, most of computational chemistry these days done is in density functional theory or DFT. And, you know, uh, here on the top, essentially, have a couple clusters of theory. This is the golden standard. That provides you systematic accuracy using one kcal per mole uh, from accurate experiment for organic molecules. And I think you know the beauty and you know the promise of you know machine learning potentials uh, in particular is to is to push this line uh, to this top left corner uh, where we can try to uh, approach the accuracy of quantum mechanics of the reference method of our choice, but also you know keep the speed. Uh, now, uh, you know, again, because of this compute expenses, you know, computational chemistry, quantum mechanics typically perceived as slow, sequential, you know, you take one molecule at a time, you compute, you know, geometry and, and, and property. Uh, however, we can learn a lot uh, from, you know, field of QSAR, statistical modeling and machine learning. So over the years, Adrian and I accumulated a gigantic database of energies and properties for over 50 million of organic now it's a unique resource that allow us to do a lot, a lot and we can uh, mine uh, this, this knowledge essentially and you know the you know combined with the particular way to represent molecules for learning and machine learning we can predict quantum mechanical energy properties and so forth so this is what i will show you uh, in my talk today now so the we started uh, uh, working on this about uh, almost five years ago in 2015. So the first methodological paper on any deep neural network, uh, molecular atomistic potential, I was published in 2017. So if you enter technical details, a reference here on the bottom. Uh, but to my knowledge, this is the first transferable neural network potentials for you know, organic molecules that you know, provide you uh, systematic accuracy about one or two kcal per mole uh, from reference uh, uh, DFT theory. And you know, just briefly how it works, you know, uh, for the purpose of learning, you know, to represent our, our molecules, we use what's called uh, atom-centered atomic environments. And essentially it's a sphere around an atom, you know, with a particular cutoff that encodes uh, you know atomic neighborhood of the molecule. So essentially what your neural network going, it's a zoom in and the part of the molecules when one you know, neighborhood at a time, and overall your energy of your molecule would be some of this, you know, atomic environments. Now, uh, how to train? Basically, you collect the database of your of your molecules. Uh, you basically take them, you know, three-dimensional coordinates, Cartesian coordinates, futurize them past the neural network, sum them up, and you know, uh, compare with reference quantum mechanical energy and you know compute error you know, compute code gradients and basically use the chain rule and, uh, and update the, the network parameters and basically train your network. so that's very standard uh, way how to train neural network uh, currently you know we we, we parameterized um, you know seven elements so if you draw me a molecule with seven elements it will give you energy and forces we work on more elements you know extend to most of the non-metallic elements um, at this point. Um, uh, we made a choice to use a particular um, DFT functional and basis set combination. So for those computational chemists 
in the audience. So this is some technical details. So we, uh, we use Omega Dimensity 7 XT with double zeta basis set. And in 2020, we, we, we update a little bit. Um, uh, so we switch to Omega B97 MV, a little bit more modern uh, DFT functional with bigger basis set. And also we have a couple of cluster, uh, approximate couple of cluster with the complete basis set extrapolation and a train uh, neural network. Mm. Now, just to show you how things work. So this is a screencast, that's a video. Uh, what I'm showing you, it's two panels on the, on the code. Uh, don't, don't be uh, intimidated, but uh, so on right, I'm, I'm running, you know, quantum mechanical calculations. Uh, and on left, basically it's a Python code to run neural network. Let me see if it works. Yes, so I run QM first. You know what you see in, on the right, so you see self-consistent fields, it's still um, uh, compute. And immediately on the left, basically it computes energies of the, you know, 73 uh, conformers, while co computational chemistry on the right, I, you know, speed up a little bit, basically computation on the right took two minutes uh, to complete for one molecule. Um, what I just show you, essentially, uh, uh, a calculation of 73 conformers for this particular organic molecules, uh, which have 25 uh, atoms in size. So this, this, this plot on the right gives you essentially a comparison reference, uh, quantum mechanical ground through uh, energy versus you know, um, predicted energies. And basically DFT time gives you, you know, uh, 11,000 seconds on a multi-core Linux uh, server. You know, neural network time is three milliseconds. So out of the box, you get 350,000 uh, fold speed up uh, for the small molecules. Uh, and this advantage actually grows to six, seven orders of value for larger molecules because, again, the, the computational scaling of, of, of DFT is, is typically qubit. <clears throat> and again, you know, I, I, I made a lot of uh, technical details here. But you know, none of the molecules I'm showing here were part of the training data. So this is true, you know, examples of you know, extrapolation and you know, computing neural molecules, uh, cell potential. Now, typically, again, what you can expect accuracy one to two kilo per mole in the relative and absolute energies. You know, this is, is quite wide uh, energy window, as you can see on the on the left side, and, and basically. Uh, our potential provide extremely high quality potential energy surface uh, for organic uh, and, you know, uh, molecules. Uh, what's you know uh, uh, what is also important that you know things like um, you know polarizable molecules with sulfur with a lot of halogens that are uh, traditionally problematic for uh, classical uh, force fields uh, biomolecular force fields. Uh, you know, uh, no problem for us. And here on the right, you see the, the potential energy surface maps for, you know, a couple of uh, the hydral angles and molecules. So on the rightmost column is a potential energy surface for DFT. And on the left is the potential. And essentially it reproduce, you know, this high quality, you know, even the smallest, smallest kinks uh, in the potential energy surface, you know, uh, is reproduced and, and, and you can see overall accuracy uh, of the potential energy surface. One, maybe two or three in some cases, and I can tell from one. Um, there is a you know, thermochemistry benchmark uh, from a uh, pharmaceutical company X. Uh, basically what they're interested in is to com compute uh, reaction energy for tile additions to Michael exception acceptors. So there's a good, interesting paper uh, from uh, uh, Ken Hogg group um, uh, from 2016, basically that you know computed and measured this energy, and you know in the company they use a particular combination of you know, DFT functional basis set to compute reaction energies. It's MO6, uh, MO6 to X uh, triple basis set, and you know this plot gives you the magnitude of R uh, versus their uh, internal. Uh, reference, but if you use semi empiric, if you still use semi empirical methods, you know, really, really bad. So you get very large reaction energy error, you know, three, five, six, in many cases, you know, can be a really huge error. <clears throat> you know, and, and in green, again, this is the values uh, for reaction energies from the 
any potential, you know, within one kcal per mole. We get uh, thermochemistry and just to be a, you know, a sanity check. So our, you know, particular choice of, of, of DFT functional. So if you use our, you know, methods give you more or less the same results. Um, in addition to, you know, thermochemistry, you can compute various spectroscopic properties. So for example, you can do IR spectra simulation, you know, using the time domain simulation. So you run molecular dynamics and simulation and, and compute uh, the IR spectra. There's a, again, a couple of examples uh, for drug-like molecules, you know, uh, QM spectra in, in, in black and machine learning spectra in, in red. And basically you, you see, you know, peaks where you expected to see, you know, there's a correct magnitude and, you know, the, the panel on the right gives you accuracy of the dipole moment. Uh, with respect to the you know, uh, quantum mechanically computed double moments. <clears throat> and the list can go on, so I will not bore you with the, you know, more examples. But currently, so I'd like to emphasize, so our software is free, it's written in Python. Uh, so seven elements have uh, been parameterized so far, so CHMO software and a couple of collagens. We have more elements coming, so internally we have a prototype with 14 elements already. Uh, we have two reference level of theory, you know, the, the DFT and couple cluster. In terms of the feature of applications, so we have you know, geometry optimization, analytic cache, and you know, molecular dynamics and various uh, uh, things. Um, you can do thermochemistry and harmonic quasi-harmonic approximations. Uh, we also have tools for you know fast and accurate conformational search. And also include of continuing the lecture. You know, it's important. Finally, you know, we, we, we also implement the technical a periodic boundary condition for crystals for you know, extended systems. And you know, we're working to um, implement what's called the main decomposition methods. We can run you know uh, calculation multiple GPUs and also stress, stress tensors and you know unit cell optimization uh, for critical structures. So those are technical um, features of the software. Now, uh, can we go beyond just predicting energy? And you know, can, how can we add more physics uh, to the machine learning? And you know, when I think about uh, you know neural network in particular, I almost can imagine that it's like a plane with Lego blocks, because all your neuron and layers, you know, kind of like a building blocks of Lego, and and essentially you're limited only by your imagination. You know, uh, how you can combine those blocks. And you know the current paradigm. You know more layers you have, so your neural network is, you know, better. Typically works, and clearly this this girl on the left is much better a data scientist than the boy. Now, so we've been playing uh, with the architecture. So if you look for a you know, simple, you know, traditional uh, neural network uh, potential architecture, so you have you know input uh, molecular coordinates, then atomic environment transformations, which gives you embeddings with things colored in, in blue. Essentially, uh, it's, a, it's a static numeric transformation as non-learnable. And uh, things in, 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 in green is the neural network that uh, learn your interaction of your essentially atoms inside the, uh, inside the atoms to predict the energy. Uh, so we've been, you know, uh, playing and try to be creative. So for example, one thing we can do, we can make embeddings you know, learnable. We can also add, you know, uh, you know extra neural network uh, to account for long branch interaction and pass, you know, uh, this through updates. Again, if, you, if you're interested in the, in the technical details, I'll, I'll have a reference uh, uh, in the next slide. But also uh, we can train, in addition to energy, we can also train to multiple properties at the same time. So your model will predict not only uh, energy, but also, you know, uh, whatever you want. And in this particular paper in Science Advances last year, what we did, uh, we learned gas phase and continuum dielectric salvation model energies. And therefore, you can directly uh, benchmark and see the accuracy of your uh, computation, uh, for example, to predict uh, free energies of salvation. So what we did, we go to MNSOL database, look for you know neutral organic molecules that have high quality 
uh, experimental uh, free energy salvation and you know uh, figure on the left show you the accuracy of prediction basically you can compute uh, free energy salvation within 1.8 mecal per mole this is pretty much the limit of the continuum salvation models that is used so being you know uh, in, you, you can com uh, compute energies and also you can compute uh, geometry so here on the right basically it's a benchmark of the of the conformational energies uh, in, in the continuum approximation again so you know references below <clears throat> now you can keep playing with this lego blocks so this year we actually you know uh, we just uh, put a preprint on chem archive you know how we extend uh you know our our framework from neutral molecules to anion and cations uh, so to uh, a charged species and you know, again, we can play with these Lego blocks and, and and be creative. We predict energies at the same time. We also you know, predict um, like here, right, in case what we call uh, MT multitask to predict you know energies of, of, of different states at the same time. Or for example, what we can do uh, uh, what what we call uh, ME multi embeddance if we can conditional neural network on a total um, you know, molecular charge and basically predict energies uh, depending on the charge. So this is really bring us closer uh, to, a, to a, a, you know, correct quantum mechanic behavior on the systems. So just show you a couple of examples. Uh, so we, we, we essentially we teach neural network how to attach and detach electrons from molecules. Uh, so we can modulate the charge Q here, you know, total molecular charge and compute energies. So what it allows us to do essentially compute the energy of the neutral cation and anion species uh, in the same geometries. And from that three and three reference energies, you can get essentialization potential electron affinity. And you know, as you can see from these plots, you know, again, the uh, accuracy from two to four like per mole. So uh, what was interesting to see is that cations are probably more delocalized. They were a little bit harder to, uh, to learn so they are about four kil per mole. But also keep in mind, so this 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 uh, this regression plots I, I I show you. So they have a color code on the log scale. So essentially, you get several order of, of of difference. And overall, there are about a million points here. So most actually most of the points uh, lay here, essentially on diagonal. And you can just see a small number of of, of outliers and the predictions. And you know uh, you know been able to compute those properties, um, you know, just, just to give you an idea when I think, you know, uh, when we, you know, shuffle this uh, logo, you know, Lego blocks and kind of, uh, I, you know, just, just to give you an idea how these things might work and why I think, you know, bringing more physics into, into machine learning is always uh, is better. Um, that I think our neural network work essentially like uh, uh, implicit spin and charge equilibration inside the neural network. So if you can, if if you take this prototypical molecule, so it's a you know a conjugated molecule with electron uh, withdrawing and donating groups. So upon ionization, either you know attachment or detachment of, of electron, you can see you know the, the spin density you know from the from the quantum mechanics uh, plotted here, and essentially you can see essentially a wave behavior. So you, you know uh, plus minus, so you know alternating of of spin density phases. So when you look what the neural network predicts uh, with, you know, initially, you know, with, without, you know, uh, looking into, into these updates here, uh, more or less, you know, you, you see the old charges, are, you know, more or less the same. And as you include these updates, you can see emergence of the spin wave behavior and, and therefore this, this, this charges and spin, uh, spin charges are delocalized uh, exactly like in, in quantum mechanics. Again, hinging in, in technical details it's in this preprint and uh, here. Now, what's the beauty of, of that approach that now uh, we can mod modulate and compute properties depending on the charge. And this allow us to do uh, one cool trick. It, it allows us to compute uh, all the reactivity indices from conceptual DFT. Uh, so conceptual DFT is, is a great theory uh, to describe chemical reactivity. 
to give us access to the, the you know, things like chemical potential, molecular hardness, electrophilicity indices, Fukui indices, you name it. So all of them are essentially behavioral properties with, the, with respect of the uh, number of electrons in the systems, and you know you can compute them, you know, uh, based on you know, on this on these equations, and it allows us to look into you know reactivity of the molecules, you know, see uh, you know why things are forming, why the reaction goes or not. <clears throat> so. Uh, we can now take our neural network and essentially interrogate it to compute all those uh, conceptual DFT quantities fully bypassing quantum mechanics after altogether after you train this neural network. And indeed, we can predict you know global uh, reactivity indices. This is extremely high. Uh, we can also compute you know uh, to a certain degree you know even uh, paratomic quantities, for example, like Fukui functions and maybe Felicity indices, you know, in, in, in certain cases, they you know, they get better correlation. Uh, in, in certain cases, we still have some outliers, but nevertheless, the accuracy of these uh, quantities is enough to do quantitative predictions uh, based on uh, conceptual DFT. Let me show you a couple of examples. One is, for example, a uh, prediction of rigid selectivity in Electrophilic aromatic substitution reactions. So this is, you know, prototypical electrophilic aromatic substitution reaction. So this is a bromination, and essentially, you know, the ratio selectivity of the bromination reaction uh, depends on the essentially on the stability of the sigma complex of the mass. Typically, you know, the prediction of ratio selectivity is hard, and you know, in, in most cases requires you know, quantum mechanical calculations. So currently, you know, there are a couple of approaches, but in particular, there's an interesting semi-empirical uh, method called Regio SQM. What essentially it does, it, 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 it computes transition states and it finds all the, all the possible sigma complexes uh, for these for this reactions using semi-empirical method in, in, in inclusion of the, of the continuum solvent. And typically it takes for small molecules, maybe like a CPU hour per time. Which and and then you can get the accuracy. You know, they build the model uh, to predict radio selectivity about eighty percent, eighty percent accuracy. So we took this reaction. We take the data set, and you know, I, again, data from this paper. And basically, we took our neural network. Didn't do any specific training for the bromination reactions. And there is some results. <clears throat> so if you just use quantum mechanical calculation, use conceptual DFT. Uh, extract those indices, bond orders, you know, uh, localization potential, build a machine learning model to predict uh, rigid selectivity for premonition. You will get about, you know, 80%, 89% uh, accuracy. Uh, if you include both DFT and same empirical calculation for the sigma complexes, so this, kind, so this, this, this the, the, the first uh, line in blue basically just requires uh, product and and reactants doesn't require transition state search, which is very slow. The second one requires, you know, uh, finding uh, the sigma complexes using semi-critical method, and you can improve a little bit basically with the inclusion of the of the sigma complexes. Basically, you can improve accuracy a little bit. So just out of the box, using uh, you know our you know, conceptual DFT feature from Alnet, as well as learned embeddings. We can essentially match the accuracy. However, as you can see here, uh, it's much, much faster. It's almost a million times faster for the, essentially the same type of accuracy. Now, finally, you know, one, one more example of reaction prediction. So this is again internal data from company Y, who are interested to um, um, predict the yield in the coupling reaction. So coupling reaction A plus B gives you C. Um, so what we take, we take the yield data and essentially we split it. When there's no reaction or there's low yield, basically, there is probably not worth to pursue this reaction. There's medium to high yield, so this reaction is probably viable. And, and uh, so what we did, basically, with data, you can go uh, back and, and use you know, standard cheminformatic 
you know, uh, machine learning methods, features, you know, representations like fingerprints, and you can get decent models, you know, maybe with accuracy 60, you know, to 70%, you know, if you use a specific reaction fingerprint, you maybe go to 75. But if you really want to push the accuracy to 80s and, and even higher, this is where you need to do you know, quantum mechanics, extract those conceptual DFT features, and basically build your model. And again, this is slow, and, and out of the box using the, you know, the, the features computed with, with AMNet, you essentially get the accuracy of quantum mechanics for, you know, for much faster speed. Now, in the last few minutes, let me just show you uh, what's next, you know, what we work right now, what you will be able to do you know, in the next year or two. So uh, we want to extend our neural network from organic molecules to biomolecules. So we collaborate with a group of Paro Akunin from uh, Berkeley National Lab and who is the lead of the Phoenix uh, software to do crystal structure refinement for uh, proteins, essentially uh, X-ray crystallography, cryo-AM, and the quantum mechanics, so, so the, 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 the crystal structure refinement pipeline is extremely long uh, and, and, and complex, but one of the last steps essentially of the refinement and improvement quality of the molecule of the model is using quantum mechanics to compute you know, essentially the densities. And uh, so currently, you know, and you know, the Again, you know, you cannot compute full protein with quantum mechanics, so they basically chop in a smaller fragment and you and, and, and basically compute many of those fragments using the, on, the, on the cluster. So currently they use a particular commercial you know, quantum mechanical codes. It's slow, it may take a day or, or up to weeks for a large structures on, uh, on the HPC uh, cluster. So we hope to swap it for you know, our potential which is free for academic research. It, it runs on GPU, CPUs everywhere. And basically, but allows you to do this calculation from you know, probably minutes on the laptop. So again, orders are quite faster. So this work is still, is still going, but what I'm probably just a couple of um, examples. We take again our, our neural net network potential, the same I, I, I showed you before. It's been trained only on organic mold. So we had a little bit data on, you know, peptides, you know, uh, three peptides, things like that, and, you know, uh, you know molecular interaction with water. Uh, but this potential never seen the full protein before. So what, when I did then, I go to PDB, just pick this particular protein, just because it has all seven elements uh, we parameterized. And I, I take this protein, which has a ligand, this GSK compound in, in the the active side, basically, I, I put it in the box of water. At this point, we don't have ions, so there's no salts. So this is your uh, distilled water uh, protein simulation. And I run this simulation for a number of, uh, of nanoseconds. And as you can see from this movie, and this is honestly a boring movie. Nothing happens, so ligand stays in the, in the active side. So it didn't go wrong. But I think this is amazing. Because this potential never seen the full protein, solvated uh, protein in the in the water, and you know uh, running simulation for a few nanoseconds, uh, you know protein is stable. You see the interactions and, and things like that. Didn't you know protein didn't explode? So it's very encouraging that you know we can build this uh, protein uh, force field as well. And one of the beauty of that uh, simulation that you know a student who actually prepared the simulation the small but very typical error. You know, uh, this is the aspartate acid, and it is protonated. And, you know, this is wrong because, you know, this is, um, this is acid and it should be deprotonated. So when you run the simulation, what you see actually, you know, the proton shuffle, transfer. So in contrast to traditional force fields that are, uh, you know, uh, limited by topology, our potential is fully reactive. Therefore, you can describe, you know, protonation, you know, adjustment to the pH, things like that, and also enzymatic reaction. So this really excites and opens really exciting opportunities for that. And you know, in the meantime, you know, we still don't have the full potential uh, for um, a protein ready yet. Uh, but nevertheless, you know, we, uh, we 
we team up with the lab of John Kader. Uh, uh, and, and, and you can use uh, essentially uh, our potential to improve accuracy of uh, protein ligand uh, binding free energy simulations. And you know, uh, one of his students, you know, come up with the clever trick how you can use ML essentially uh, to compensate on the inaccuracy of one in, in your you know, traditional force fields. And we took this kinase example that you, uh, from uh, you know, the Schinger set uh, of the binding free energies. So this is kinase challenging example. Uh, typically, when you when you co compute this um, free energies, you have you know, number of outliers and overall R square is, is quite low. Uh, so we, when you use, you know, uh, you know, machine learning, you essentially get the approach to chemical accuracy and, and really reduce the number of outliers and improve the accuracy of the free energy simulations. Again, very new preprint uh, just here uh, referenced below. With that, let me finish and leave you with that last slide. Uh, most of our got, uh, code on GitHub. Again, if you're interested to use Ani, we have a you know, um, library with, uh, coupled with ASC Python environment. Uh, we have implementation in PyTorch. So plugins coming for you know various molecular modeling packages like OpenMem, Amber, Namdi, you know, also soon Plums, SteamCareHP, and other. Again, AMNet in GitHub. So uh, reference quantum mechanical data, again, if you're interested to use it, it's here. It's been used across academia and you know, several companies and government institutions with that. Thank you so much for your attention. I'd be happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you, Alexander. So if you have any questions, please type them in uh, into the question box. Okay. Uh, so yes, yeah, so uh, first of all, yeah, there, there is one person who would like to thank for the really fascinating uh, uh, talk. Uh, uh, the question is, uh, what do you use as a yield threshold to distinguish between no reaction, low yield, and medium high yield? Have you tried to model yield prediction uh, as a regression task? Ah, that's a great question. Uh, yes, in that particular example, we did try to um, do regression. Unfortunately, we didn't, we were not very successful. One of the reasons, because this yield was computed, uh, com basically recorded after purification and you know other steps. So it could not only, you know, yield in this particular reaction step. What I think we did uh, medium to high was over 50% if I'm correct. And if it's below 50, basically it's low or something like that. Right? But I think, yeah, it's, it, it's around 50%. Thank you. Uh, another question. Uh, is there any limitation to your algorithm in terms of the size of the molecules, number of rotatable bonds to predict conformers? In principle, no. However, with the specific conformers, again, uh, you will limit, because if, if you want to do exhaustive conformer search, you will still have to compute all rotatable, you know, account all rotable bonds, right? So the number of conformers grow exponentially. So at certain point of, you know, number of rotable bonds, if you want to compute all of them, it just will take, you know, you'll have like a millions of conformers which is impractical. Uh, so method itself doesn't care how many, you know, you know, rotable bonds you have. However, if you want to accurate sampling, you will be limited by how many conformers you can generate and feed. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so another question, between AIMNET and any 2 which has given your better results in predicting small molecules' energies? Ah, great question. Uh, unfortunately, again, I skip all the, all the technical details. Um, so in terms of mutual organic molecules, they're more or less the same. You get the difference where the long-range interactions, you know, 
give you a strong company. Things like, you know, again, insolvent, you'll get charges, you know, in the polar environment, things like that. There, AMNet has advantage because of this, you know, of the message passing essentially, uh, passing the long range interaction through our update layers. Uh, so for chart, you know, for cations and ions, we can definitely see advantage of the of the AMNet architecture versus ions. But for small organic neutral, you know, molecules, they more or less the same. And you know, AMNet being a you know, more layers, you know, more complex architecture, it's lower. It's still much faster, but comparing to, you know, ANI, which is a very small neural network, uh, it's, you know, MNET a little bit slower. Thank you. Any other questions? Let's wait a few more seconds and uh, okay uh, if uh, there are no questions I would like to thank you Alexander and uh, all of you again for uh, for, for for joining us uh, in this webinar and uh, if you have uh, in, interested in uh, Alexander's work, please email uh, your questions to myself or to Alexander directly. We'll, be share, we'll share with you the YouTube uh, uh, link uh, to this webinar recorded probably tomorrow. And uh, if you need to, if you, please follow us on LinkedIn or Twitter or our Instagram and YouTube channels for the updates. Thank you very much and have a good one. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.